It's reasonable to expect that when soldiers become prisoners of war, they are safe for the moment. A prisoner has no weapons, he is no real threat. But in many POW camps, the death rate actually increased after capture. Some died from wounds or starvation or disease or beatings. But others died simply because they lost the will to live. I had always believed that there was a will to live and if that will to live disappeared, uh, well, you died. Uh, there's much more to it than that, I'm sure of that. It's a bit like bone pointing. You point the bone at yourself, I guess. I've seen many cases of fellows who have been nigh unto death for maybe a couple of weeks, semi-conscious most of the time, being hand-fed by their mates, amazing to still stay alive. And then when they recover from that and they're starting to be getting better or uh, think they're getting better, they just up and die on you. And I think what happened to them was that they'd look around and see fellas dying around them and think, oh, it's, it's too hard now, let me go. James Ling encountered this attitude in one of his mates on the Burma-Thailand Railway. And he came in this night about 11 o'clock and he said, you can have my rice. He said, I'm not going to carry on. I, I, he said, there's no one at home. I'm not married. He said, uh, there's no one at home that would worry too much about me. And what we used to do if anyone said that, we'd, we'd beg them not to and say, don't be silly. And, and then we'd abuse them, really abuse them, tell them they were cowards, anything. Yeah. And sure enough, he lay down, he wouldn't eat his rice. And at six in the morning, he was gone. No, and he was a, a what I, I often said, and others said too, I wouldn't have had the guts to do it. You had to have a, a fancy just having the guts to decide you're going to do that. In some camps, death was a daily visitor. But during the Korean War, in a freezing camp near the Manchurian border, Robert Parker discovered that death also had its uses, even if they were a bit bizarre. And it was cold and we have to all huddle up there like this and you have to sit there like that all day. And they'd uh, come around to see how many dead, any dead. We had a few, but we wouldn't tell them. They were propped up against the wall and uh, so they wouldn't fall down. Of course, if, that if there's any dead, they take them away and then they don't give you so much at, at uh, one meal a day, they didn't give you so much food. They give you less three, three dead, if there's three dead blokes there, so we ended up out of mob of them prop, propped up around the world until finally we had to let them go. The Australians had a very high survival rate in the Japanese POW camps of World War II and they did well in the camps in Europe and during the Korean War as well. Some say this was because of the better hygiene practiced by the Australian officers and men. Others put it down to their discipline or even to what they called the national character. What really mattered though was having a sense of hope. I mean you had to have some sort of hope or belief uh, about getting home. It never occurred to us that we wouldn't get home, despite the fact that you see people around you dying. And hope could come in many forms. Ray Parkin could draw and paint, and he found a way to bring beauty into the palm hut he shared with other prisoners in the jungles of Thailand. Well, I drew a lot of insects, butterflies, all sorts of things like that, flowers, anything. But also, I had plenty of blokes to help me. Because as we went out, we used to find things to discuss, and we would discuss the new flowers that were out or what was happening. With the butterflies, of course, there were millions of them up there, beautiful, in flocks. All the blokes around me 
were collecting butterflies and insects. You got this, have you got that? Of course, I didn't have time to paint it all. So what we did, we got little slivers of bamboo and made pins out of them. And on the inside of the Adap hut, we pinned these things on the ceiling. And we had a ceiling covered with these beautiful butterflies and everything. And I thought, well, this is better than the Sistine Chapel ever could be. In many camps in World War II, the prisoners hid their biggest hopes and most dangerous secrets, forbidden radios and their plans for escape. The radios were used to keep the men's spirits up and news was passed secretly from man to man. BBC news would come on about seven o'clock. We wouldn't hear it, it would be on a secret radio somewhere. We would take it down in shorthand and then the reader would be snuck from one hut to the next and it'd come in and there'd be someone to sing out news up and everybody would be quiet. The BBC news was read out and the fellow would disappear off to the next hut. And that's how we kept up with the news. Even in some of the Japanese camps, radios were cobbled together from bits and pieces the prisoners scrounged or stole. It's astonishing that they could not only build these radios, but keep them hidden from the guards. And when the war news was good, they had to keep that to themselves as well. You only got fed to you a little bit because I suppose the officers were always concerned that if we got too agitated or excited by good news, we'd do stupid things, you know. Uh, people would try to escape or some other silly thing because you, you could never escape from the islands at any time because there's nowhere to go and the natives had a price on your head anyway, you know, all the time. The biggest blow a POW could deliver to the enemy was a successful escape, but not everyone was keen to try. Some POWs hated all those who tried to escape because of the punishments that were inevitably handed out to those left behind. A lot of people that were prisoner of war were happy to be prisoner of war. They weren't going to jeopardise their lives. When you're with people for a long time, you can practically tell whether a person is going to sit or a person is going to try to escape. There's a way they go about things. In Europe, the favourite method of escaping was difficult and dangerous, tunnels. But that could mean cave-ins that left them buried under tons of earth, a foul air supply, and no room in the tunnels to turn around. Still, these young men kept trying again and again. They were determined to escape. Jeff Cornish was in Starlag Luft III. Our average age in air crew who were shot down was probably 22 to 23. Whereas in the naval camps and the army camps, where a whole group of men were captured at once, you had probably everything from a lieutenant colonel or a senior officer down. They'd learned a lot more of the common sense that you were talking about. We never had any other thought but to get out tonight or at the very latest tomorrow and that was the overriding consideration and motivating force all the time. Starlag Luft III was where the most well-known escape happened, the Great Escape. Over 70 men got out on one remarkable night. They dug three tunnels in case one or more of them might be discovered and called them Tom, Dick and Harry. The tunnels were located an astonishing nine metres below the surface, but they were just four-tenths of a metre square. Bill Fordyce, a pilot, was the last man into Harry on that night in March 1944. But by that time, the Germans had discovered them. And of course, by the time I got to the exit, the Germans had found the tunnel. People were screaming down the shaft to me, get back, the goons are here. Then the German came up and started to shoot it with his machine gun down the 30-foot shaft. So the only thing I could do was turn around and go back. It was, it was a very a strange time because 
we knew that a lot of men had got out. The Germans didn't know. So we were delighted, thought, just imagine the upset we're causing. And of course, it wasn't for three or four days that the Germans told us that they'd caught, they said they'd caught everybody. And they said 30 men have been shot whilst trying to escape. The senior British officer said, how many were wounded? Because, you know, you don't kill everybody when you're trying to stop them. And uh, the German officer said, none were wounded, 30 were killed. So we immediately knew that they'd been just killing them when they caught them. At least the POWs in Europe could try to escape. The chances of success from the Japanese camps in Southeast Asia were virtually nil. Eight blokes tried it. They all got caught. They were all brought back. They were shot. Others tried it and they died in the jungle. So you just didn't bother, there's nowhere to go. There's safety in numbers. It was safer to stay where you were than try and take off. About 700 Australian POWs in Europe during the Second World War made it to safety after escaping. From the Japanese camps, it was less than 10.